They, devote them, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everybody was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed all the proceeds to all, as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day the Lord added to the number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Lord Jesus, we are open to hear from you now. Your word is alive. We know that. We confess that every Sunday. We know that your word can cut really deep. And we know that your word contains life. And uh, that's what we need this morning. So breathe into us uh, life through your word. Teach us what it is that you would want us to know, say, and do. Help us to be transformed and strengthened. And help us today, Lord Jesus, not to be resistant against the work of your spirit but rather to be obedient. May your name be glorified as we open up your word now. We pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's look at the teaching text again. I told you that I want you to memorize it through the course of this series. I want to show you to a few highlights. Look at it. All believers held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property, and they distributed the proceeds to all. Wow. What a picture. Why on earth did they do this? Well, because they believed in Jesus and the words that he said. Let me show you again, Matthew 6, 21. Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Treasure and heart go together. Where and there. You see, your money shows you where your heart is. And if we look at Acts 2, it tells us that the hearts of the people were with the church. And that's why their money was with the church. Because where your money goes, your heart goes. And where your money ought to be is where your, oh, sorry, where your heart ought to be is where your money ought to be. So if your heart's in something, your money is in it. It's just how it is. It's a biblical principle. So where is your treasure? Your treasure. And where is your heart? I've asked this question to you before, but let me ask it again. If you would show your monthly budget to us this morning, what will we learn about you? What will we see if you show us your monthly spending patterns? Well, we'll see your priorities. We'll see what you value. And we'll definitely see where your heart is. I think this is a really good question to ask your budget. If we look at your budget, will people see that you are a Christian? And if we look at your budget, will we see that God is first in your life? Now that's an important question. Why? Because we worship money. It's just how it is, fam. The world we live in worships money. We think if we have it, we will be satisfied. And you know that it's true, that it never brings the fulfillment that we long for. Never. Because you can never have enough to find that fulfillment, because that fulfillment can only be found in someone else, not something else. And that is Jesus. And the sooner we stop believing the lie that money brings fulfillment, the better. The reason why these kind of sermons and these kind of scripture readings are hard is because money is something that lies close to the heart. So it feels very personal and revealing to talk about it. And often we don't want to talk about it for various reasons. I want to invite you to take a moment and to just be attentive of what happened in your mind and in your heart when I said these things and when I asked you these questions. We need to go there this morning. It's part of covenant commitment. So please go there with me this morning. Don't be resistant to what the Word of God says. Because what I'm going to do is just explain it and expound it. So our theme for today is giving of your treasures. Giving 
of your treasures. Why is this the theme for today? Well, because it's part of covenant commitment. Let me show you. These are the five things that we are inviting you into. Look at number four, the purple one. It says giving of your treasures generously and consistently. That's why we're talking about it. Why do we talk about this? Because it's also part of our discipleship journey. Let me show you our triangle again. We say that a disciple loves God and loves people, and a disciple gives generously of time, talents, and treasures. Why do we talk about the giving of treasures? Because it's part of our response to the gospel. And we said this morning when I laid out our three things that we are a gospel-centered church. Let me show you. This is what our website looks like. Do you even know that we do have a giving page? Look top right. There's a new blue covenant commitment button. Please do go onto our website and click it. It's quite cool. You'll see that it says we are a generous people who imitate our generous God. We respond to the gospel by bringing our first and best because God gave his first and best in Jesus. We have to talk about this because it's about a response to the gospel. It's part of our discipleship journey and it's part of the invitation to participate in covenant commitment. Let me show you another portion of scripture where gospel, generosity, giving and money and treasures gets mentioned. Read it with me. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. And then we're going to read 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 12. Here's 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Whew. Loaded verse. We'll get back to it. And then let's look at 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 12. Still Paul speaking, still speaking to people like us, the church. And he says, the point is this. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. As it is written, he distributed freely, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Let's look at verse 10 to 12. Now, the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Wow, we what a portion of scripture. Now, from this portion of scripture, we see that we give generously because we are gospel driven, because giving is a privilege, and because we are a channel of God's grace. Look at those three things. We give generously because we are gospel driven, giving is a privilege. And we are a channel of God's grace. Now these three points explain why we read what we read in Acts chapter 2. They were gospel driven. They did see giving as a privilege. And they saw themselves to be a channel of God's grace. Do you see how these two portions of scripture link together? So we saw something in Acts 2. We see an explanation of it in a different portion of Scripture. And this explanation in the different portion of Scripture gives us an explanation for why the church in Acts 2 did what they did. Now let's look at these three things. Firstly, we are generously, we give generously because we are gospel driven. Look at 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. Well, before we look at 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, we need to back up a little bit and just catch up on the story. Will you look at this slide with me? This uh, picture lays out what happens in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Okay? So Paul is speaking. And Paul says, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem need... And then non-Jewish Christians in Corinthians, Galatia, and also called the Macedonians said, that's awesome, if they need and we have, we will give to them. Okay? And now Paul says to them, you guys forgot what you commit to. 
You guys forgot what you committed to. You're not giving as you were asked and you were compelled to do. And also, you promised to do something and now you're not following through on it. And the issue we have here, Paul says to the Corinthians, is poor churches are giving way more than you, a rich church. Because the church in Corinth had much more money as, uh, uh, um, as opposed to a church like the church in Macedonia. So now Paul says, guys, something is wrong here. Firstly, because you promised. And secondly, because you're being outperformed by the fact that you're not doing anything. Read the scripture with me, 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1 to 5. Paul says, We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. During a severe trial, brought about by affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Whoa, just, just hold on. Look at that verse. During a severe trial, things weren't going well for the Macedonians. And that's why they gave much. During this trial, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty caused them to do something. And that was to give wealth of generosity on their part. I can testify that, says Paul, according to their ability and even beyond their ability, of their own accord, they begged us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of the saints, and not just as we hoped. Instead, they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us by God's will. My word. Can we please give? And can we give more than we actually can? Because we are motivated by something else. And that thing is a big enough motivation for us to get in and to help with this offering. They had a motivation. And what was their motivation? Let's go back to the slide. Their motivation was what we find in the middle and in the bottom. So firstly, their motivation was the gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 in the middle. And their motivation was to be like Christ. That's what I appreciated about your video, Connie, is you said your motivation for giving generously is to be more Christ-like. So what did Jesus do? Jesus gave everything so that someone else could have. And the Macedonians looked at that picture and they were like, hmm, hang on a second. If we want to be like our Savior, then we should do what our Savior did. And he gave everything. So we should give as much as we possibly can. Why? For you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. We've experienced it. And because we've experienced it, it motivates us. And because it motivates us, we could not help ourselves. Look at the highlights in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 8. You know. And what do you know? Well, you know the grace. And what was that grace? That grace was the great reversal. Rich became poor so that poor could become rich. That's why Jesus gave it all. And that's our core motivation for why we give. Now, I need to ask you, do you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you? Do you know that God looked at you and saw you and saw your poverty and saw your need and knew that you needed saving? And do you know that He then decided to give everything to save you and that He actually did it? God loves us and that is why He sent His Son. And He doesn't want us to die and live apart from Him for eternity. And that's why He gave everything so that we could have everything. Do you know this? If you say you do, then I want you to be sure that you know it more than just in your mind. It should be something that reverberates through your whole being. My kids are still small enough that I can actually pick them up that they can wrap their legs around me and that I can get a good old bear hug grip on them when I hug them. Now, that hug starts with, I love you. And then they say back to me, ooh, I love you too. And then I, uh, I don't know, I say a whole bunch of cute stuff 
because they're still small and I'm a dad and they're girls and I love cute words. So I would say stuff like, oh, love a dudes, my clean cut a dudes. And then she would say, oh, love a dudes, my papa dudes. And then as I hold them, I actually experience what I'm saying to them and what they're saying to me. It, it, it reverberates through my whole body. You know what I mean? It started with words exchanged. And then it started with a mechanical kind of hug. But then something else happens. And that is that I know that I know that I know that I know. And that they know that they know that they know that they know. And I feel it in my body. Love it. I'm already sad about the day that Ava's going to be too big for that. Lamenting for what lies ahead in the future. It's going to be a hard day. Because I mean there will be a day that I'm going to go... Okay, yeah, let's just keep it down here. All that she's going to say, Dad, listen, I'm 15. We actually don't do that anymore. But I'll keep that for that day. Do you know what I mean? That's knowing. Is that how you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Like, does it reverberate through your whole body? Is it something that you know? Because if you do, then you should be compelled to give. And you should be motivated to give. And it shouldn't be something that you are resistant to because you actually know what your core motivation is. Look at Romans 5 verse 8. It says, But God proves His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God went first. And why did God go first? Because God is first. Look at how the whole Bible starts in Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning... And then what? God created the heavens and the earth. In theology, or in theological language, we say that God is preeminent. He existed before everything else existed. He's so first that He was first in being first. Before the first. Know what I mean? That's God. And that's also why He went first. And that's why He should be first. The Apostle Paul talks about things of first importance. The book of Revelation talks to the, uh, um, the church in Ephesus saying that you lost your first love. Our motivation to give generously is because God is first. And our response to Him is that we put Him first. I know there are many other things that vie for your attention and your love and your affections. This is your choice to say that my commitment to God and my response to the gospel will be first. Let me show you our giving page. It's all up there. We wrote it because it's something that we believe. Look at the second sentence. We respond to the gospel by bringing our what? First and best. Because God gave His first and best in Jesus. Look at the third bullet. It says, our hearts... And our minds are renewed by the gospel to graciously compel us to give sacrificially and with a cheerful heart. Money reveals our hearts. So what if your money only points to you? What if your money only points to your things? What if your money only points to your pleasures? Well, then your heart is with you. And your heart is turned in on itself. And you are the only thing that you care about. I heard a pastor say once in a sermon, he said, people often say to him, you just want our money. And then he says back to him, no, I don't. You just want your money. <laughs> and that's the problem. And that's why people are resistant to giving. is because we think that it's all about us. We aren't the first people who have this problem, you know. The Corinthians had the same problem. It's not new. But because we are driven by the gospel, we want to retrain our hearts. And the way that we retrain our hearts is by putting our treasure where our heart is supposed to be. It's a response to God's open arm on the cross. And we teach our hearts by putting our treasure somewhere. My, all, you can say it like this, my heart ought to be with God first, so I'm putting my money with God first. Covenant commitment gives you an opportunity to say, well, I've never given, I'm going to start giving. Covenant commitment gives you the opportunity to say, I've been giving, but I haven't been consistent. And I haven't been generous. So I'm going to do that from this point onwards. Fam, 
I am now speaking as your pastor. Covenant commitment and you giving generously and consistently is about obedience. It's about your heart. It's about your response. Signing up and saying, this is what I plan to give every month for the next 12 months, is not about honor and shame. Please do not believe that lie. It's not a competition. It's about obedience. It's not about winning and losing. And all of this information will be treated very confidentially anyway. You don't need to worry about that. It's about your obedience. So be freed by that remark. Don't get to that point in your covenant commitment, sign up and go, oh snap, who's going to think what of the amount that I put in here? Get to that point and go, this is what God has laid on my heart and this is what I'm going to write. And I'm going to be obedient to it. We give generously because we're driven by the gospel. We also give generously because giving is a privilege. Look at 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 again. Paul says, each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not in his spreadsheet, and not in his notebook, in his heart. And then once you know, then you shouldn't do it re reluctantly or out of compulsion. You should do it with a cheerful heart. So the word heart is really important here. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. We get to do this. It should be something that we do joyously. Something that we appreciate as a privilege. And your personal responsibility and your honesty is really important here. Why? Because only you will know. I mean, just think about that. How awful would it be to go to bed every evening and then be confronted with your own disobedience and no one knows about it except you. Think how awesome it will be to go to bed every evening at peace because you are obedient and only you will know. <laughs> because Paul says each person should decide. I can't decide for Gladys and I definitely don't know what's going on in Shiami's heart. You need to decide for yourself. Personal responsibility and honesty. Now, usually when we get to this point, when we talk about money, the elephant in the room is, how much should I give? Like, what is our measure? Do we have a percentage? Don't we have a percentage? Let me show you the first bullet of what we believe giving is all about. All that we have and, and are belongs to God, bought by the precious blood of of Jesus. We don't have a percentage measure. Rather, the question is, how much do I need? That's your measurement. Or, how much do I keep? Because the rest of it can go. The rest of it can be given away. The rest of it you can sow. And that might sound very radical. It's actually not. It's biblical. Look at what Matthew 6 verse 90 to 21 says. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Look at what Paul says to Timothy in the first letter that he writes to him, chapter 6, verse 17 to 19, he says, Instruct those who are rich in the present age not to be arrogant or to set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things to enjoy. Did you see that? Do not set your hope on the uncertainty of wealth, because it's here one day, and it's gone the next. Who's not here one day and gone the next? Only God. As an everlasting God. So that's why Paul says, rather put your hope in God. And then he says, tell rich people to do what is good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the coming age, 
so that they may take hold of what is truly life. Our sights are not set, sorry, our sights are set on eternity, fam. Our hope is in the future. Our hope is not in our stuff. Do you realize that? As children of God, we inherit everything that was given to Jesus. The whole kingdom will be ours. For the rest of eternity, we will have everything we need. Forever and ever. And ever, ever, and ever, ever. Only the outcast fans will catch that one. That's where our sights are set. And remember when I say these things, I say it because it's about your heart and your affections. It's about wanting to give more. It's about wanting to go deeper. It's about wanting to grow. It's about wanting to experience this generosity in its fullness. It's about what Paul says in, in 1 Timothy to take hold of what is truly life. Now, how do we do that? How do we take hold of what is truly life? We take hold of what is truly life by trusting. Trusting. Both portions of Scripture that we just read, Matthew 6 and 1 Timothy 6, is about trust. Here's another one. Back to Matthew 6. So, don't worry. Don't worry. Saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Fam, this is a massive growth point for me as well, you know. I'm not only preaching to you, the scripture also preaches to me. Every single time I get anxious about money, and about provision. And about everything we need. And I pray about it. And I say to God, God, this is what we need. Do you know what God answers me with? He answers me with, I know. I know exactly what you need. Far deeper and far more than you know anyway. I might have an amount that we need for next month and the month after and the month after. God knows infinitely more what we need. The way that we talk about money, the way that we think about money, and the way that we are generous is supposed to be weird and out of step with this world and this culture. Look at Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He says, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Woo! Rapper. Let's read it again. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. I don't believe in God, says the non-Christian, but you make me question that disbelief. Because of this motivation and this incredible generosity that you show. Covenant commitment is an opportunity that if you are already a giver, and if you are already a consistent giver, this is now another opportunity for you to be intentional about your giving. And to say, well, does my giving look like a priority in my budget? And am I maybe changing some of the other things that I'm spending money on so that giving can become a priority? This is an opportunity for you to think about is giving governing your spending and your saving or is your spending and your saving governing your giving? Because that's also a mistake that we often make is we spend and save and then we give. We should actually give first and then spend and save. Maybe this is an opportunity for you to think about the home that you want to buy or bought. Maybe this is an opportunity for you to think about the car that you have bought or that you want to buy. Maybe this is an opportunity for you to think about how much money you choose to keep in relation to your, gener uh, your generosity. This is a deep moment for us as a church, and that's why we're talking about it. Remember, we get to do this. It's a privilege. Let's grow in this together. So that was point one and point two. We are gospel driven. Point two, giving is a privilege. Last one, short one. We are a channel of God's grace. We are a channel of God's grace. Look at the highlights. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity. And through this generosity, it produces thanksgiving to God through us. The ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions 
to th uh, of thanks to God. Just think of the impact and the effects of your giving. Think about this. Someone gets what they need because you gave. And then more and more people say, thank you God, thank you God, thank you God. What a beautiful thing. Because we are a channel of God's grace. God's grace is meant to reach everyone everywhere. And through our giving, that can actually happen. The impact of our giving and the impact of our money, among other things, are furthering the vision and the mission of this church. Think about it. Seeing more people come to faith, seeing more people being saved, seeing more people being transformed. That's what our ministry is aimed at. And your giving can be a channel through which that grace can flow to other people. Think about that. If someone who's new and saved says, Thank God that someone told me about His love for me. See that? It's expression of thanks to God. If we give, then people who pray, give us today our daily bread, can actually get their daily bread. Do you realize that? Every time you give bread to someone, you can actually be the answer to their prayer that said, God, please give me my bread today. We long to be a church that can let money flow through us so that people who need daily bread can get daily bread. Our financial position in the beginning of the year didn't allow for that. That was really sad for me to say, well, we don't have enough money to give away any money. Which is really sad because we've given away a lot of money because we know that we have people who need. We want to get back to that place. And your giving can help us get back to that place. And then obviously, through your giving, God can receive all the glory. Because your giving is a testimony of His grace and His character. We are a channel of God's grace. Let me show you the first line and then the last bullet and the last line and then we'll be done. Look at the first line again. We are a generous people who imitate our generous God. Do you realize that if you're a selfish person and you share the gospel with someone and you tell that person that God isn't selfish, it's really going to be hard for that person to believe you. Think about that. You, you're telling me about this God. And you're telling me about how awesome He is. And you're telling me that He's changed everything for you. But you are really judgmental and really selfish. So why would I believe in this God? Do you realize that? That's how big the impact of our generosity can be to other people. Look at the last bullet. We show the world what the character of God is like through our generosity. That's why we talk about this. And that's why we do it. See what God is like. And then lastly, like I just said, your generosity continues to help us to carry out the vision and mission which God has called us. Both here and in Centurion. Oh, so, sorry, both here in Centurion and beyond. That's the last line on our giving page. That is the impact of our giving generously and consistently of our treasures. Amen. You guys can uh, come and take the stage for us to respond in song. I want to give us an opportunity to respond. So I showed you in the beginning of the sermon that giving generously and consistently are one of the things that we're asking you to commit to during covenant commitment. Maybe today that's your response. Today your response is, I'm going to start giving. Please do it. Do not harden your heart. Go for it. Fill in the sign-up form and put your amount there and stay faithful to it. Some other responses that I think are, are applicable this morning is you might know the gospel, but you might not be driven by the gospel anymore. So maybe this morning is an opportunity to re-appreciate the gospel again. Maybe you've forgotten that this is a privilege. And maybe you need to say thanks again for the privilege of being able to do this. Or maybe today your response is that you have been a holding tank or a dam instead of a channel and that you need to repent of it and say God I've been holding on and I'm going to have to start letting go 
please help me to do that, and please help me to be a channel of your grace. Let's close our eyes. Lord Jesus, we want to live for your glory. We want to give for your glory. We want to be channels of your grace. We want to appreciate the privilege of giving. And we want to be driven by your gospel. Give us today what we need in this moment, now, to be able to respond to what it is that you want us to do. I pray for all the first-time givers that they'll do it with a cheerful heart. I pray for everyone that would be that need to be reminded by the gospel that the gospel will pierce our hearts again. I pray for all of us who maybe have lost the passion for you and have lost the passion to say that I get to do this and this is my privilege. I pray for everyone rather holding on than letting go that you would free us today. And that you would give us an eternal perspective of where we're headed. And that you would make us cheerful, obedient, and generous givers. All for your glory, Lord Jesus. We pray that in your name. Amen.